Hi. It's, it's always a distinct pleasure to um, read in Manchester. It feels a little like um, coming back home. Uh, so, um, thank you for coming out for this. Uh, and this feels, I mean, particularly special um, for me when I was in Manchester. Um, one of the persons who was especially kind and generous to me was Linda Chaseon. Um, and so it's um, very touching to read at points and players, which I know she helped me start. Uh, and so I'll read this first poem, um, kind of thinking about her as well. Um, so a poem I don't generally, well, I've tried not to read. Uh, it's, I wrote it for a friend called Hannah Anzranikova, uh, who is or was a Czech novelist um, who died from cancer way too early. Um, so I was thinking of Linda. Uh, it's the first poem I wrote before the collection began, and in it is a line that pretty much sums up the whole collection, and the line is a prayer for the languages we know these landscapes by, which is what the whole book is trying to do. I ended up being in a bayou on this day when Hannah wanted us all to pray for her, and the boat came across a beaver that stood perfectly still, and I was amazed by it. A prayer for the unflummoxed beaver. A prayer for the unflummoxed beaver, so unmoved by the boat's slow approach, the boat drifting across the flat green acre of water, a prayer for these acres of water which in the soft light seem firm. The squirrels, however, are never fooled or taken in, a prayer for the squirrels and their unknowable but perfect paths. See how they run across the twisting highway of cedars but never crash. A prayer for the cedars and their dead knees rising from the water like tombstones. A prayer for the cedar balls that break when you touch them and stain your fingers yellow that release from their tiny bellies the smell of old churches of something holy. A prayer for the holy alligators. You owe them that at least for just last night when you thought of Hannah and Dronikova. You asked them to pray with you knowing that their prayers are potent at night. The grass is full of their red eyes. A prayer for the grass which the alligators divide in the shape of a never-ending S. You lean over to pull some into the boat in Burma. This is called canapa and can be cooked with salt and oil. A prayer for the languages we know these landscapes by, for the French as spoken by fat fishermen, the fat fishermen who admit to the water we all dying. You understand, savant? A prayer for the dying that will come to all of us, but may it come soft as a boat drifting across the bayou. May it find us unrattled and as unflummoxed as the beaver. So the whole collection is um, called The Cartographer Tries to Map Away Design. Um, and I'll probably read mainly from that sequence, or almost all from that sequence. And as you'll see, it's just a, it's a very contentious conversation that emerges between a cartographer who ostensibly visits Jamaica to map out its roads, and a Rasta man who disagrees with pretty much everything he's doing. The cartographer tries to map a way to Zion, one in which the cartographer explains himself. Ooh. You can just put it on speaker, she can listen to me, really. <laughs> <laughs> Though that's unfair, they didn't pay you. <laughs> the cartographer tries to map a way to Zion, one in which the cartographer explains himself. You might say my job is not to lose myself exactly, but to imagine what loss might feel like. The sudden creeping pace, the consultation with trees and blue fences and whatever else might prove a landmark. My job is to imagine the widening of the unfamiliar and also 
the widening ache of it. To anticipate the ironic question, how do we find ourselves here? My job is to untangle the tangled, to unworry the concerned, to guide you out from cul-de-sacs into which you may have wrongly turned. Two, in which the rest of man disagrees. Now the rest of man has another reason. He says, no, that man's job is never straightforward or easy. Him work is to make thin and crushable. All that is big and as real as ourselves is to make flat. All that is high and rolling is to make invisible and worthless. Plenty things that poor people can't do without, like board houses or the corner shop from which Miss Kitty sell our famous peanut porridge. And then again, the map maker's work is to make visible all them things that should have never existed in the first place, like the conquest of pirates, like borders, like the viral spread of governments. Three, the cartographer says, no, what I do is science. I show the land as it is without bias. I never fall in love. I never get involved with the muddy affairs of land. Too much passion on steadies the hand. I aim to show the full of a place in just a glance. Four, the rest of man thinks, draw me a map of what you see. And I will draw a map of what you don't see. And guess me whose map will be bigger than whose? Guess me whose map will tell the larger truth? There is um, um, a wonderful illustrator, Kai Cross. He did this. Uh, if, if you look on the map, um, you'll see when, you, when a map is put on a flat surface, uh, most of us will know this map, it's Mercator's projection. And in order to accommodate the whole globe, you have to distort it a little. So um, the things on, the, on either end are bigger and the things in the middle um, become a little smaller. Because of this, Africa is much smaller um, than it should be. And Mercator did this wonderful illustration where he fit in everything in Africa. Um, Every country that could fit in Africa, he put it there. Um, and some people um, think that this is, you know, a conspiracy. I'm really glad about this. The Guardian reviewed the book today, um, and they quoted this poem, and I thought it's the only time um, I could ever get the word blood clot in a broadsheet in the UK. I'm sure all of Jamaica is very disappointed in me right now. Six after Kai Cross. For the rest of man, it is true, dismisses too easily the cartographic view. He believes himself slighted by its imp Oh, sorry, I'm just one small word that you wouldn't know. In, in, Kai, Cross's in Kai Cross's thing, he comes up with a word called imapancy, uh, which he wants to link with innumeracy and illiteracy. He says imapancy is to have insufficient <coughs> geographic knowledge, which I think is lovely. For the Rasta man, it is true, dismisses too easily the cartographic view he believes himself slighted by its imperial gaze. And the Rast says, it's all a Babylon conspiracy, the blood clotting mapancy of this world. Maps which throughout time have gripped like girdles and made his people smaller than they were. I'll flip quite a bit just to read a poem that mirrors it. 14. But the cartographer, it is true, dismisses too easily the Rastaman's view, has never read his provocative dissertation, Capture Land as Identity Reclamation in Post-Colonial Jamaica Hill. The cartographer did not even know the Rastaman had a PhD from Glasgow, no less, in which, amongst other things, he cites Sylvia Winter's most cryptic essay on how we mistook the map for the territory and re-imprisoned ourselves in an unbearable wrongness of being. <laughs> There's a sequence that I won't read, um, but this is the poem that opens up that sequence, and the sequence is about place names in Jamaica. Nine in which the cartographer travels lengths and breaths. Give him time and he will learn the strange ways and names of this island, the clapping ascent to Baptist, 
the thankful that takes you up grateful hill, grateful hill, just round the corner from content will know the rough and proud to boldness and blackness, the painful chains to bad times, the long and short to three miles, six miles, nine miles, eleven miles, whose distances incidentally are unrelated to each other, will know the haunting that takes you through Doppigate, the slow that goes to wait a bit, the correct etiquette to a compound, even to Minosen Yenokom, will know the grunting path to hog hole, the struggle required for effort, the pothole roads to shambles, rat trap, and put together corner. As well, the cartographer will know places named after places, how this island spreads itself out as a palimpsest of maps. For here is Bethlehem, here is Tel Aviv, here is Gaza, also Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Egypt, Cairo, and here is Bengal, Mount Horeb, Albion, Alps, they say all of here is Babylon. 10. In which the cartographer asks for directions. <laughs> Sometimes the cartographer gets frustrated when he asks an informant how to get to such and such a place and the informant might say something like, all right, you know the big white house at the bottom of Clover Hill with all the windows then board up and with the ice the roof that look almost like a church. Yes, the cartographer says. And in front of the house, you always see an old woman only three teeth in her mouth and she out there selling pepper shrimp in a school chair with an umbrella tied to it. And beside her, she always have two mongrel dogs and one of them is white and another one is brown. Yes, I know exactly where you mean, the cartographer says. And in the yard, there's a big guinea tree that hang right out to the road. So school picnic always stop there to buy shrimp and eat free guinea. Yes. Yes, the cartographer insists, I know it. Good, says the eye formant, cause you must go there. <laughs> Eleven. Um, by the way, there's a, uh, there's a wonderful stately home in Jamaica called Devon House, um, which is the first house at that grand scale built by a black man. And Devon House is right down the road from King's House, the Governor General's house. And, and there's this really weird road in Jamaica called Leading Musgraves Road, which goes around that. This is kind of the story of that. Eleven. At other times, the cartographer is amazed by the hems and haws and shrugs of our roads, how they never run shore, but seem to arc or bend or narrow just so an avenue will turn on itself, as if to give you back a place you have just come from. Lady Musgrave's road was laid in its serpentine way so that Miss Musgrave on her carriage ride home would not have to pass a nigger man's property so much bigger than her husband's own. She did not want to feel the carriage slow and know her driver had just then turned his face to Devon House, a thing wet like pride in his eyes and nodding to himself, yes, is Miss Astebel Bildant. And to think that such spite should pass down even to the present generation should dictate the thoughtless, ungridded shape of our city, the slowness of traffic each evening, to think that one woman's pride should add so much to our daily comment. This is something the cartographer does not wish to contemplate. Still, he wonders if on his map he could make our roads a little smoother, a little straighter, as if in drawing he might erase a small bit of history's disgrace. Um, flipping over. And it's just to give you a kind of idea of how the conversation rolls out. So this later again, um, 16, in which every song is singing Zion. Because the cartographer gets convinced about the um, Rastaman's views. In which every song is singing Zion. On evenings, when we put pillows to our ears, trying to mute the sermons of a thousand DJs broadcast on boomboxes across this island, it is then that every track leads to Zion. 
Bob Marley, Luciana, Junior Gang, Wingless Angels, Delroy Morgan, Buju Bantan, all of them is a chant down Babylon, all of them is a chant Armageddon. We dream ourselves alone by abandoned rivers. Oh, miss a man, will you ever understand why such songs spring from this strange land? Uh, I said I wouldn't read poems outside of the sequence, but I'll read this one just because I told you about um, blood clot earlier. Which I think is, I find it very strange that um, it should become such a potent word in Jamaica. Um, which, anyway, this poem is about that. Um, which is translated back into English. The blood cloths. The blood cloths. Acknowledge then the ingenuity of women, who, when cornered, fished out the cloths of their menstruation, raised them in their hands like conquering Japanese flags, acknowledged then the high decibels of men dashing through cane, distancing themselves from such soft, soaked weapons they had not known could be formed against them and raise then a cloth against the dark corners of Cain and a cloth against such corners as they still exist today and acknowledge then the staining blood of women which gave to them victory, shining bright as rubies. And this is Towards the end. This is 26, in which the Rastaman gives a sermon. The Rastaman says, to get to Zion, you must begin with a heartless. But by the way, I'm going to pronounce a word that I know that you would say shami, and I know that that's the correct pronunciation. I'm going, to, I'm going to pronounce it how we would pronounce it in Jamaica. It's not that I don't have the right pronunciation. <laughs> just, just by the way. In which the Rastaman gives a sermon. Because somebody, somebody did correct me before, and that's very annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> 26, in which the Rastaman gives a sermon. The Rastaman says to get to Zion, you must begin with a heart this. A small tilt of the head, a nod, Thumbs and index fingers meeting to take the shape of eye blood, then raise like a badge to eye chest, then you say it, heartless. A simple word that don't cost nothing to give but is plenty to receive, like sometimes you meet an Idrin at your door who come not only with a gift from his own acreage but also a word, how well you look. How beautiful the little children are, the house, how well appointed an Idrin with whom hours pass too quickly and who, upon leaving, offers yet another word, how good it was to see you and for brethren and sisters to sit in the simple of each other's love so that it strike you how both his coming and his going were announced by blessings, my brother. A man like that is already well on his way to Zion, so begin like that, a heart bless. The old Rasta man's chanting up of goodness and rightness and of course, upfulness. How excellent is that word, upfulness? As if it was a thing that could be stored in the tank of somebody's heart so that on mornings when salt was weighing you down, when you feel you can't even rise to face Babylon's numbing work, you would know at least that should the day wring your heart out like the chamois towels of street boys, then out of it would spring the stored portion of upfulness. And so anointed by your own storage, you would be able to face the road which is forever inclining heart, hardward. Know then that every heart bless given is collected by Jah like mickle and muckle or like a basket full of cocoa and comes back to you like a dividend. You find your feet at last straying off the marrow roads, the bauxite roads, the slaving roads and marooning roads and you would be turning now unto the 
singing roots and the sweeting roots that lift you up to such a place as cannot be held on maps or charts, a place that does not keep still at the end of paths. Know this, that lions who trod, don't worry about reaching Zion in time, is Zion that reached the lions. And this is the very last, very short poem in the collection. 27 in which the Rasta man gives a benediction. In leaving, the Rasta man bids you manners and respect, eyes is and protection, hopefulness. He bids you guidance and health, unity and strength. He bids you trod holy to highly, highly, highly Mount Zion. Trod holy. Thank you.